Good morning, everyone. Glenn the Geek here, host of Horses in the Morning. It is September 2nd, and we are home. That's right. We got home yesterday in the afternoon to pouring down rain, but uh, that's okay. We're here. It's sunny today in Florida, and I want to wish all of you in the Northeast the best. It looks like we got out just in the nick of time, but I know a lot of you are dealing with power outages and flooding and all kinds of tornadoes and stuff up there, so our thoughts are with you and all our friends who we just saw up there. Uh, We hope that you are hanging in there and that you are doing well. Uh, Today is supposed to be the driving episode, and uh, we're going to give you one of those in the best of form. Uh, Tomorrow, we'll have a brand new show for you. Jamie will be here, and I'll be here. We have no guests planned for tomorrow, so it'll just be the two of us and hang out, talk a little bit about the trip, catch up, see where we're at, and then uh, do some really bad ads, too. So get your ads into Jennifer at HorseRadioNetwork.com. We have $400 in prizes provided by horse lovers. Uh, this month, so you want to check that out and make sure that you submit your ads. Well, I heard on the trip from a couple of people that they liked, longtime listeners, that they liked the episode about Wendy when I put her on the hot seat and talked about her past and her history and her dad and all of that. And they liked that. And then a couple others said, oh, I haven't heard that one yet. I want to hear that one. So I'm going to give you a best of. And it's called It's All Wendy. And it was all about Wendy and uh, her going to bed school and how she got into driving and her family. Her dad was a fascinating guy. I wish I'd met him. Uh, so we thought we'd replay this episode for you, for all the new listeners who haven't heard it in a long time. Or if you have heard it before, maybe you want to take a listen again. So this one's called It's All About Wendy. We did it back in 2016, so it's been five years. So for new listeners, I think you're going to enjoy this, and we'll have a brand new episode for you tomorrow from Horses in the Morning. This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 244 of the Driving Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are the American Driving Society, Driving Digest, and Road to the Horse. This is Glenn the Geek. And I'm Wendy Ying, and you're listening to the Driving Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. And we have a show planned for you today. Wendy has no idea what she's got herself into. You know, we have so many new listeners to the show, Wendy, that we thought we would uh, do something a little different today. The only guest on the show today is you. Oh, my God. You are the guest. (laughs) And I am going to interview you. All right. So we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to go to the end. But this is going to be kind of the biography of Wendy. You know, I think a lot of the new listeners don't realize how far up you got in in the whole driving world. And, you know, they 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 like you. We have a lot of people that listen to this show because because they like you and they're not drivers at all. You know why? Because they're waiting to see if I'm going to swear on the air or not. Or, or sexually kind of harass some handsome gonna, guest. <laughs> what kind of wacky thing you're going <laughs> to do? So, uh, you know, I thought it would be fun this week for to learn more about Wendy. And because we have so many new listeners, I just thought this might be a good time. So I hope you all enjoy this. And, you know, before we get started, I do want to, a couple housekeeping things. One is we have now have signed contracts in hand f- uh, from our title sponsors for Radiothon 2016. Yay! So the second annual Radiothon is going to happen. We are actually much further ahead time-wise than we were last year. Yep. So I hope, Wendy, that you can, you'll can you entertain coming up and sitting in of again. Of course! That was a lot of fun. I love Radiothon. We might, uh, maybe we can get Jamie or, or Helena or somebody to come down too. It'd be fun just to have an p- all-day party in the uh, studio here. It should be an all-day party. And that that uh, we're very excited about. That's going to be November the 28th, uh, Cyber Monday. That's the Monday after Thanksgiving. So it'll be 12 hours live, just like last year. And it, we're, we're, you know, we're already talking about what big name guests we can get and oh, yeah. what kind of fun things we can do. To, to But, you know, last year it went, it went so well. I, you know, we're going to run it kind of the same way. We'll have a new theme this year. It'll be holiday related, but... 
uh, we, we're going to try and come up with a new topic of conversation every year. So, that sounds good. And of course, we need, we'll another, have, we need another George doll. We need the George I know. too. <laughs> we'll have voicemails, of course. You know, we're going to have our listeners contribute because that was such a big part of last year's Radiothon. That's and, what I like the best about it. And our call in, you know, our listeners calling in and thousands of dollars in prizes. Let's not forget that either. Oh, yeah. The prizes were great. <laughs> so we're get, we've got a lot of cool things coming up for this year's Radiothon. And uh, I, you know, as we're speaking, uh, this is coming out on Tuesday. I am on my way on Wednesday to Road to the Horse. Don't forget to check out our coverage this weekend. Go to Horses in the Morning Facebook page or horsesinthemorning.com, and you can find all the details about the live Road to the Horse coverage coming up this weekend. That is brought to you by our friends at Horse Lovers. For all of your shopping needs, the largest online retailer for the horse world at horselovers.com. They are providing, uh, they are the title sponsor for this weekend's coverage, and we appreciate them being part of this coverage. And we also have a bunch more sponsors that have signed on, including Horseware and Cashel products and a little pet vet have all signed on to uh, provide this live coverage eight hours live we're going to be doing from the kentucky horse park this is only one of i think two events every year that sells out the stadium the alltech arena and there won't be a seat to be had it'll be completely sold out and people come in all three days to watch it so the driving show does not sell out the alltech arena no, Road to the Horse does. My, whenever my dad used to see pictures of me competing, he's like, why are, Why is nobody there? Are you just practicing? <laughs> and I'm like, no, people don't come Nobody to comes to watch me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about you. Wait, I have a housekeeping thing, too. Oh, do you? Okay, go ahead. I am totally, I want more people to go like our Facebook page. I saw that we only have a thousand something likes. I know. So, We're falling way on, behind people. horses in the morning. You don't have to go look at anything over there. Just click like on it. <laughs> It'll make Wendy's ego feel better. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Feeling so lame. <laughs> yeah, just search for driving radio show. And you do post good stuff on there. I do. She posts on there almost every day. Yep. And, uh, and always interesting, fun stuff about history and carriages and all stuff. It's really I just cool. posted a super cute video of a cow getting rubbed by a mechanical brush. I mean, yeah. What more could you want? I don't know, but I've been watching that all day. It's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> all right. Let's get started. So where were you born? I was born in uh, Andover, Mass. Well, I lived in Andover. I was born in Lawrence General Hospital in Massachusetts. And now tell me about your parents, because to be honest, I've known you for how long? A lot of years. A lot of years. And I'm still confused by your family. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you need a chart. Okay. I should have written your chart. But my dad, uh, my dad passed away actually just a couple months, I think, before I met you. And my dad was born in uh, communist China. And, uh, you know, the the revolution the cultural revolution was going on when he was like i think he was three so my uncle was four my dad was three and the two my two aunties were two and one years old and my grandmother she my grandmother actually just passed away last month she was 98 years old wow and she was like the bossiest little Chinese lady you've ever seen in your entire life, which I always say that's where I get a lot of my bossiness. Bossiness from. from. <laughs> so uh, my grandfather was away on business when the communists actually came through her town. And um, she always tells us she was a princess. We don't know if this is necessarily true or there's no history to prove that, but she tells us all she was a princess. So when the communists came, they would um, they would kill the people in power, you know. But so she needed to escape, and she went to the train station and shoved all four kids through a window on the train, and then went to the back of the line and told everybody, "I got to get on there. My kids are on the train. My kids are on the train." And people let her in, and that's how she got out. And where did the train go? Where did they end up? Oh, it went to like Shanghai, and then she eventually got to Hong Kong. And then she lived in Hong Kong for many years. And then, um, but even still, I can totally believe that story because she never waits in line for anything. She always has some <laughs> excuse why she needs to be in the front of the line. So, 
Um, but then uh, she sent my dad and his brother off to Swiss boarding school when they were little kids, like 15, I think. How did she afford that? Well, my grandfather was a, I mean, maybe she was a princess. I don't know. She supposedly buried all this treasure in the ground and, and she made my uncle take her back there, but we, they couldn't find the treasure. But my uncle was, I mean, my grandfather was um, an inventor and a scientist. So he, they had a, you know, he had a great job. Wow, what a story. Yeah. <laughs> buried treasure. I know, yeah. Buried treasure. We always <laughs> laugh about it because we're not exactly sure if those are Princesses. true Princesses. You up. come from royalty. I know, but that could be just a fantasy. It could be true. I don't know. Well, who knows? But <laughs> uh, so when my um, my dad and, and my uncle went off to Swiss boarding school, it, it's a, such a super cool story. It used to make my dad tell me this story all the time. This was like, you know, back in the early 60s. And so she had all their clothes made for them, like, and they were different sizes to fit them as they grew by these Hong Kong tailors. And then all their stuff went into these big trunks, like steamer trunks. And then she loaded them on a boat and they took a boat to Switzerland from Hong Kong. Hmm. And... They were in the, like, I don't know if you've seen Titanic, you know, with the third class or Mm -hmm. whatever. So they could only stay in their beds for a certain time because they shared the beds with other people. Oh, wow. You know, you could only be in your bed for like half the time and the other half the time you had to be walking around. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So then uh, my dad, um, he decided he wanted to apply to college and he was applying to this Swiss. Oh, that's why they went to Switzerland because my grandfather wanted them to go to this engineering school in Switzerland. So they had to learn to speak Swiss because it was taught in in Swiss, but they also learned English while they were at this school. And my dad applied to like uh, the Swiss school. And then he also applied to MIT because he was looking in this big book and he didn't know what MIT was, but it said, no application fee for Chinese students. So he's like, oh, I'm going to apply. So he applied and he got in, but he wasn't going to go. He was going to go to this Swiss school. And his professor said, are you insane? You just got into MIT and he (laughs) better go. He didn't know what it was about. And so then he and and my uncle went off to MIT in the 60s. And had no idea that they were going to one of the top engineering schools in the world. No, my grandmother was pissed. (laughs) Why? Because my grandmother, you know, I mean, for people that don't live in the United States, they see stuff going on in the United States that think is scary. She thought everybody has guns and, you know, well, she's Chinese, so she's a little bit racist. She's like, you know, there's only Chinese people there work in the Chinese restaurants. What are you doing going to America? You know, she was like (laughs) terrified. She didn't want them to go. So she wrote them a letter in blood because she always likes to write letters in blood to get her point across. Really? Oh, yeah. That's like a common thing for her. You know you're in trouble when you get the letter and it's in her own blood. Oh, jeez. <laughs> She's very dramatic. This story is just incredible. I, know. So then I can they just got picture my... this little woman. <laughs> oh, she was so, yeah, she was super bossy. <laughs> so, so then they got to here to MIT and they both, well, my uncle actually majored in architecture and my dad of course was uh, majored in computer science and then they started um, a company called ATEX which was kind of like the thing that the ATEX system did was set type kind of like you know word wrap like we have on computers now but before we had uh, desktop publishing people had to set the type Mm -hmm. like so for printing yeah so before the ATEX system they still were using like the Gutenberg type, like you had to take the little squares yep. of tile by hand That's and right. put that into the machine. So the ATEX system actually made the jump from that to uh, a computer setting the, the type. Huh. Because uh, actually we had good friends when I was growing up and I was little that were had a print shop. And they mm-hmm. used to go let us go in and play with all the little letters. Right. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's what it was. It was li- little letters by hand that you would put into a thing, and then you'd run the print. You'd run the paper over the ink. And it always smelled good in there. It always smelled it like ink. Yeah. 
Yep. And then they sold their company to Eastman Kodak. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So what did he do after that? Well, after that, he decided to retire because he was like, they were like the first generation of, of like computer people, right? So he retired, but my dad can never retire. So he retired and he moved to Hawaii and he learned to windsurf. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then he met Jackie, my stepmom, and they would travel around and they windsurf and they had a ton of fun. And, but they always loved Hawaii, so that was their home base. But my dad only could stay retired for a couple of years, and then after that, he loved. Um, they also he he had a house in in the Silicon Valley, and he loved to, you know, he loved the progress of the internet. And I remember one time when I was little, he took me to his friend's house because he and his friend were like angel investors for these up and coming, coming companies. And guess whose house it was, Glenn? I don't know. Nolan Bushnell. Do you know who Nolan Bushnell is? No. He invented Pong. Oh. <laughs> and he also, so he invented Pong and he started Atari and he also started Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, really? Yeah, and so because you remember Chuck E. Atari Cheese had and Chuck E. Cheese games. both. <laughs> yeah, because Chuck E. Cheese had all the video games. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I don't want to go to this guy's house, Dad. You know, like, because I was a kid, and he's like, you're gonna want to go to this house. <laughs> so he took <laughs> me there, and he had like a huge slide in his pool, and he had like this room full of all these video games that he had designed. And we were so excited because it's like, oh, look, we can play all these video games for free and you don't have to keep putting quarters in. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I know. So. so he, so what point did horses come into play for you? Oh, when, when um, well, okay. You, you know, like, there's no secret. My mother and I don't get along. Because she is just like, <laughs> just on so many different levels, we just don't match. Like, she wears tons of makeup. She's always worried about what everybody thinks about her. So when I was little, um, she decided that I should ride because, you know, that's what fancy people do. So she got me the whole outfit, and then I had to go down to the barn and take riding lessons because she thought horseback riding was like an upper-class kind of thing. But the place that she took me to go riding was like this, like the worst, the, it was like the worst barn to go riding at you could ever imagine. Like they never brushed the horses. It was like really muddy. It was like Not pony club sp- approved. No, it wasn't like a fancy stable. But I had a great time and I, I loved the horses. And then after when she realized like, wow, this is like not very glamorous. Because I used to love to muck the stalls. I used to stay at the barn all day, and oh, she picked me up. And I dirty. Smell. Oh yeah, and I smell really bad. <laughs> and she'd be like, "This is not really what I thought riding was about." And she wanted me to quit riding, but my dad wanted me to keep going. He loved it, and he thought it was great because I stayed out of tons of trouble. So, when you first started riding, were you what were you doing, Hunter? Or uh... Uh, I was just starting out trail riding, and then I did hunters when I was a little kid. Like I did uh, 4-H, and then I did Hunters. And um, and in fact, you know what's really fun is uh, because of Facebook, I am reconnecting with all my old riding trainers. Like, um, oh, and you'll know this person. This is my very first uh, riding instructor was Joy Kellett. And her sister is Sue Jacoma. You know Sue Jacoma, the dressage person? Yes, yes. Well, we used to make fun of Sue because Sue decided she didn't want to jump anymore. She was going to do dressage. We're like, Sue, come on, dressage. <laughs> How lame. She does and pretty I, well with that now. And then I picked up the, uh, I saw a Practical Horseman or something. And like, here's Sue on the cover of Practical Horseman. <laughs> so I <laughs> called her and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you're on the cover of Practical Horseman. I'm so sorry we were teasing you back then. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So now you, uh, so you continue to do that. And at what point then did, did, did you drive your first horse? Oh, well, I, um, well, I went off to college. So I stopped. Yeah, where'd you go to college? I went to San Jose State. 
Okay. You decided my dad you was wanted, living. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah, surfing out was in California. In, That's right. Yeah, and he, he had a house <laughs> in Silicon Valley. And he, he was actually renting it out to his friend. Um, and so I was like, I remember it snowed in Massachusetts on like Easter. And I was like, this is it. I hate it here and I'm leaving. And so I told my dad I wanted to, I was not very good in school, in my high school days. Uh, but anyway, so I had bad grades, so I couldn't go to Stanford. So I was like, well, good. I'm going to San Jose State. All you have to do is sign up. You don't have any like entrance examination. So I just, in fact, actually, I think I started at community college, which was awesome. It was like a mile from the house and I could just ride my bike. And I took things like tennis <laughs> and English. It was really fun. <laughs> and um, so I lived at home with his friend, Huming, and I had a great time in California. And then I went, and then I went to San Jose State and I got my degree in molecular biology. And... I was fox hunting while I was living there. I I fox hunted with uh, Los Altos hounds. And I thought that was like the best thing I ever did in my life. Fox hunting for sure is way more fun than driving, way more fun than anything. Um, And then... You and my wife agree on that one. Yeah, fox hunting is the best. And then I went to vet school in North Carolina. And... uh, Now, was vet school really hard to get into back then like it was now, like it is now? It was really hard to get into. I had really good grades. I mean, I was a bad student in high school, but when I got to college, I, you know, changed changed myself around. And anybody that knows you now, like I do, is going, I can't believe she made it through college, let alone vet school. I know. (laughs) Well, I I had this great mentor. Not that you're dumb. It's just that uh, the work ethic thing, the ADD kicking in. The ADD. I know. Well... I was boarding my horse at this stable in California, Webb Ranch. And my and it's like a condo for horses. So, you, you know, you rented a stall in the barn and, and it was California. So they had like a little run out thing. And my neighbor was this woman, Cynthia, that was like this super awesome scientist. And she's like, you know what you got to do? This was like in the 90s. She's like, you need to major in molecular biology. They have a great program at San Jose. And then, you know, you can work in my lab. So I, I was like, okay. I didn't know what that was about, but I was like, that sounds good. So I did that. And it was actually super cool because it was like the kind of the beginning stage of biotech. Like they had just kind of put PCR into the mainstream of what we were doing. And it was really fun. And I worked in her lab in the summers. And I was on the road to Big Pharma, Glenn. <laughs> Were you? I on, yeah, I was on the road to Big Pharma. And sometimes I look back and think, why the hell didn't I didn't do that? I do that? I'd be so rich right now. <laughs> You'd be retired by now. <laughs> I know. I was Big Pharma in the Bay Area. I would. I would be like a billionaire. Oh, uh, right? you'd have been bored. You'd have been in a lab all day, every day. Oh, you'd have been bored. Whatever. I'd be rich. But <laughs> anyway, so foolishly, I applied to vet school and I got in. Well, let's take a break here. I want to come back and find out. Uh, we'll get to the ultimate question is how you got started driving. And then we'll talk uh, uh, We'll talk in the second half here about your driving career, which I think a lot of people don't know much about. So let's do that coming up right after this word. Wendy and I would like to remind you how important a membership to the American Driving Society is. Many of our listeners have joined the ADS since hearing about it on the show. Is it your turn? The benefits of membership include four issues of the award-winning The Whip magazine, featuring all the latest news, trends, and how-to articles for the sport of carriage driving. Every ADS member looks forward to getting this every quarter. Two issues of the Omnibus, the ADS Guide to all the recognized competitions around the country, the Buyer's Guide, the number one resource for goods and services for carriage driving community, plus eight copies of the Wheel Horse Newsletter sent out in an enhanced full-color electronic format or a black-and-white paper copy mailed directly to your home. Access to the members-only section of the ADS website, which includes a comprehensive membership directory, dressage tests, and the rule book, and an ADS membership card and decal to display your membership proudly. Go to the AmericanDrivingSociety.org today to get your ADS membership. Tell them Wendy and Glenn sent you.
If you're a driving fan, then you need a subscription to the Driving Digest. It is just that simple. It's the finest magazine for drivers all over the United States with the most informative articles and the best pictures, of course. Get yours today at drivingdigest.com. That's drivingdigest.com. Well, welcome back, everybody. And today we are doing something a little different on the driving show. As you know, we are, I am interviewing Wendy. We're learning about Wendy's life. You know, we've been doing this show for almost five years, I think. So we might as well learn something about the host, right? <laughs> After five I know, years. five years. I can't believe it. I know. It's been a long time. So now we uh, we were at the point where you went to vet school. How was vet school for you? Oh, I loved it. Yeah? If anybody's thinking of going to vet school, I can highly recommend North Carolina State. It's a great school. Now, did you buckle uh, down or what was, you know, did you really focus on studies? I did. I did. Yeah? Well, <laughs> mm, now that I look back, no. I, well, you know what was great about North Carolina? First of all, the barn is right there at, on campus. So you can, um, you know, because I, I knew I wanted to be a horse vet. So I wanted to be able to be in the horse hospital as much as I could. And a lot of other schools, the horse hospital is off site and you only get there your last year. But I, I needed some like hands on stuff. So that's why I went there. But then also, Glenn, did you know what they have? They have a working dairy where the kids now make oh, really? their own ice cream and they sell ice cream. Huh. I know. We didn't have ice cream when we were there. But we had a, a goat breeding farm, and I was in charge of the goats. I was a goat sex girl, so I would take the goats. Um, what do we name them? Sly, after Sly Stallone. And uh, what's that other guy that's married to Goldie Hawn? Oh, I don't know. You know that guy? So anyways, we named them after movie stars, and it was my job to take them out to have sex with the girls. <laughs> and uh, and you, were the we breeding, all... you were the goat breeding manager? Yeah, I was the goat breeding manager. <laughs> and then um, it was a volunteer position. I didn't get paid. <laughs> and then we also had a horse breeding uh, herd, so we got to breed quarter horses. And we had... You know what we had that was really fun? We had turkeys and ducks and uh, chickens in a commercial house. <laughs> and you could go into the turkey house, and if you sit down, all the turkeys come at you like zombies. It's actually super fun. So this was really, I mean, you, you learned to work on all the animals there. Yeah, you, it, you don't have to track at North Carolina, so you do everything. It's actually very fun. And um, North Carolina, like Raleigh area, is really has really grown since I've been there. But when I was there, it was still very horsey. Um, so I lived on a little horse farm and I had, a, you know, retired, my retired show hunter. And um, I was started breeding my Irish drafts there. Oh, really? And yeah. I didn't realize you were into that so early. Oh, yeah. I was like, I was like a diehard Irish draft person for a while, but the politics just got to me. Um, but yeah, I, I loved the Irish drafts and I was breeding them and importing them to my little farm. And then, uh, I was out trail riding one day and I came across this girl with this carriage and it was Dee Dee Bushneck who we've had on the show before. And Dee Dee drives Morgans and Welsh ponies. And I was like, wow, that looks fun. She's like, yeah, you should come out. And I'm like, mm, I should, but that looks, you know, fun for you. But I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> so um, then I saw Dee Dee at the hunt ball and she had offered a, uh, a lesson, you know, for the silent auction. So I thought, oh, I should do that. So I just, I bought the lesson at the silent auction and I went out and took my first driving lesson. And it was um, in a Meadowbrook on this bumpy like field. And I was like, this is terrifying. I don't know why you do this. I thought it was super <laughs> scary and I never wanted to do it again. Which is the reaction of a lot, most riders when they first do a carriage. Yeah. And I was gripping the seat of the Meadowbrook with my legs, like really tightly, you know, and every time I was trying to turn, I was like kicking, I was using my legs. And, um, so I thought, well, I'm not going to, drive but then Dee Dee wore me down and showed me how much fun it was and I just I started doing more and more and I I loved it hmm. now was it, did you start driving then from there 
Yeah, I I was driving her horses. You know, I was going over and taking lessons. And then um, I thought it would be fun for the Irish drafts to drive because the Irish drafts in Ireland, they used to have a class called the utility class. And it was for the mares. And they had to be shown with a foal next to them. Then you also had to ride them. And then you had to drive them to a carriage. And then you had to pull a little log through a obstacle course. Because the Irish drafts in Ireland were like an all-around farm horse. And so I thought, oh, that'd be fun. So I, I made Dee Dee train my Irish draft mare how to drive. I started driving her. What was your first carriage? Oh, my or first cart? carriage. It must have been a Meadowbrook. Isn't it everybody's? <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I think it's a law. I think it's required. But I don't think my Meadowbrook lasted very long because I remember having this huge wreck in it, and it splintered into a million pieces. <laughs> like I, I, um, I can't remember if this was my carriage or not. But anyways, my dog, I had this dog cookie that I bottle fed. It was a lab and she had absolutely no rules. I was a super bad mother. I'm so glad I didn't have kids because I didn't discipline cookie at all. And she was wild. And Cookie, like, ran in between the horse and the carriage, and I ran her over with the Meadowbrook, so, of course, it flipped over, and I got dumped out, and then the horse ran with the carriage and nobody behind it and then tried to jump this fence but didn't realize the carriage was attached to him, and the Never carriage split well. into a million pieces. <laughs> but he was a good fox hunter. That thing could jump anything. I mean, he, he would have made it. It's just the carriage. <laughs> Didn't. That never goes well. <laughs> and then you know what? This is a funny story about the carriage. It was like in a million pieces, right? And you remember Swanson Chapel? He's a carriage restorer. We've had him on the show yes, before. Yes. Swanson's like, I'll take those pieces. I was like, what are you going to do with these pieces of stuff? And he actually put that thing back together and he had it and sold it at Martin's. As a usable carriage? Yes, it was drivable. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't understand how this is possible, but he did it. So when was the, when did you get the bug to go compete? Um, well, I lived in Raleigh, so at the time, uh, Southern Pines was one of our, it was a big mecca for carriage driving. But Southern Pines was also super cool. If you've never been there, it's like the three thousand acre Moss Foundation is right there, and that was donated by some fox hunters to the people of Southern Pines and all these farms are around this area and you can, uh, all the farms have easements in between. So you can ride and drive all over town. So I went down there fox hunting, I think. And then I saw this combined driving and I thought, wow, that looks super fun. So they, it was called yellow frame farm. I'm sure some of our listeners will remember yellow frame farm. Uh, that was the first combined driving show I went to see. And then I decided that I wanted to do that. So I, um, I bought a little Welsh pony and, uh, I bought a different carriage, like a three phase carriage. And I went to my first combined driving event down there. Did you have a coach at that point? Um, I actually didn't have a coach cause Dee Dee didn't really like combined driving at the time. She did more pleasure driving, but, um, because I just showed up like a total, you know, dummy, not knowing anything, Luckily, Randy and Kitty saw me and took like, pity on you. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, I was like, who are all these bossy girls? But then I realized like, oh, I do really need help. <laughs> so they used to help me all the time. They're like, what are you doing? Don't walk that way. You can't make that turn. What are you thinking? I, and uh, let's let's also mention you were the only Asian girl they had ever seen show up at a driving competition. Well, like, <laughs> And you know who was one of my very first friends was in combined driving? Megan Benj. Oh, yeah. Because Megan's dark, too. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were the only one. But also, Megan, Megan breeds Welsh ponies, so she loved my pony. So that's how it started with one. Yeah, and, I just had one single pony. And how long did you compete in singles? Well, I had that pony, and then I, uh, I sold him, and I started to drive my Irish drafts. You know, actually, how I started to drive my Irish drafts? This lady wanted to have a clinic at my house. So I said, fine. So she brings this guy, this, you know, you know how I feel about European trainers, right? I'm not going to say it on the air, but they don't always have to be good. They have to have an accent and something else, and they somehow have credibility. 
So this guy comes to my house and she doesn't have anybody to fill the clinic. So I start dragging horses out so that he can at least do something. So I say, well, long line this one. So within like about four seconds, he has my 17 hand Irish draft, who is like a saint. Okay. This horse is like the easiest horse. He has him on his hind end and then starts whipping him. And then he fell over backwards and was whipping him when he was on the ground Mm. in this clinic. And I was like, okay, this demonstration's over. Over. Out of my house. (laughs) And he's like, well, you know, this horse will never drive. And I was like, oh, really? (laughs) This horse will never drive. (laughs) I was never planning on driving this horse. But then since that guy said that, I'm like, this horse is going to drive. (laughs) So that was Jeremy Finch, my big chestnut horse. And I, uh, I took him through advanced. But you know what, Glenn? He was had he Lyme the first disease. horse you took up to the through advance? Yeah, he was yeah. my first advanced horse. But he had Lyme's disease. Oh, really? And it, he, he just could, I couldn't keep him sound uh, with the Lyme's. I, and I think maybe if I knew what I know now, you know, with the Chinese medicine, but I, I hadn't done Chinese medicine at that point. So, and I had a, a spectacular rollover in, in the gulch with him. Oh, really? Down here at Live Oak? Yeah, it was my very first show. I decided, um, I, I decided I'm going to go advanced. And I said, and it's wintertime up here in Virginia, so I'm going to go to Florida and go into this, to this show. I was so stupid. I had no idea. <laughs> I had never <laughs> been to Live Oak before. And I was like, I'm just going to enter advanced Live Oak with Jeremy. So I go, and people were telling me, like, hey, you know, this is kind of dangerous here. Just don't come running down the hill at a million miles an hour. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't need your advice. So I come running down the hill at a million miles an hour and my front wheels hit the sand and just like plant. And I go flying out of the carriage. Carriage rolls over. You know, like under the bridge there. Was that how you met Chester? (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) So then he found you in a pile of dirt on his farm. Yeah, and I'm still holding on to the reins, right? And I'm under the bridge. Oh, getting dragged? Yeah, he because he's 17 hands. You know, I'm like 150 pounds, and the carriage is like 350 pounds, and he's like a giant Irish draft. So he just keeps going. I don't think he even knew we flipped over. And he dragged me up the hill at Live Oak. And then when he got to the top of the hill, it started to get a little tough. Like I guess it was pulling too hard on his mouth while I was being dragged and the sand was going down my pants. So he stood up on his hind end, this 70 hand horse at the top of this hill. And somebody had a picture of it and they, they erased it because they said it was too graphic. And I was like, God, I would pay a million dollars for that picture. Did he come down on you? No, no, he was, no, I was way back. I oh, you were way back. Yeah, you were being drug. So, so, <laughs> That's how I learned water skiing the first time, to let go of the, to let go of the ropes when you fall. I, exactly. Uh, you, I didn't, yeah. I wasn't going to let go because this is my horse. <laughs> so I got to the top and then like four people ran in and grabbed him. And I was like, phew, thanks for grabbing him. <laughs> and I was like, let's untack and I'll go back to the barn. And they're like, what are you talking about? They're like, and they're like, get in this carriage right now. And they put me back in the carriage. And they're like, you're going to finish. And I'm like, are you insane? I just <laughs> rolled over. I have sand in my pants. I'm crying. All my watches Sorry, were stopped. Just... I'm like, I don't want to keep going. And they're like, this is combined driving. You're going to keep going. Which I think in the rules now, when you roll over, you yeah. have to retire. <laughs> so I'm like, Jesus. Okay, fine. So... I go and I'm crying on the way out of the gulch, (laughs) but I hadn't eliminated myself because I guess I went through all the gates. So I go, none of my watches are working. I start to get my confidence back and I finish. So I come over the stop line, the, the, you know, I come in. Did you have a navigator at that point? Yeah, I had a navigator. Where was the navigator? (laughs) She was, huh? Did you had your navigator fallen off? Well, she said, well, she saw that we were rolling, so she stepped off. Well, yeah, like, no oh, kidding. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe She's you could a smart one. <laughs> why don't you lean on the other side? But anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so we finished, and I actually didn't get any penalties except for the rollover, which was 60. But, you know, like I came in the time. <laughs> and I finished the marathon. I'm like, oh, thank God. I'm like, just, I just want to get to the end. And 
I see this woman walking towards me with this shoulder bag and a pea cup on a stick. And I'm like, no, this can't be happening. So, of course, I got drug, te- drug tested as I'm coming off the marathon. <laughs> I was like, okay, this day can't get any better. <laughs> but I finished. You know, I've always I, wondered how you knew everybody in driving. It's because they all saw that first event. Because I'm that girl. It's when you and Jamie <laughs> talk about that girl. And so they gave me, actually, the sportsmanship award at the end. That's when I first met Chester. He awarded me the sportsmanship award because of my disastrous performance. And that's the only <laughs> awards I've ever won at Live Oak. <laughs> I don't want to be that girl, girl, that girl, that girl. <laughs> That's just I am for that you, girl. Wendy. <laughs> so you met Chester because you were in the dirt, uh, eating dirt for about a half a mile on his farm. Yeah. That's how you met Chester. That's how I That's met Chester. That's funny. I never knew that story. <laughs> it's actually not funny. It's kind of awful, <laughs> <sorry>. but... <laughs> I can't but. help it. All right. So now, now, when did you go from singles to pairs and then fours? Oh, well, you know, this pony that's coming home to retire, Ghosty? Yeah. So I was, um, you know, I had this other Welsh pony and, and the lady that bred it, she used to like to send me these ponies and they were wild, like untouched by human hands. I don't know why I did this for it, but I mean, some of them were nice. She calls me and she says, Wendy, you have to take this pony. I sold this 12 hand pony to these people and they told me it's a killer pony. It jumped out of the cross as an attack, the husband. And I was like, well, it's 12 hands. Like what damage could it have done? <laughs> so anyways, this pony comes to me and he was super cute. His name is ghosty. And, um, I mean, he already knew how to drive. He was like perfect. And I also had another hackney pony at the time named Caroline. And, uh, they didn't go as a pair. Oh, I know, but I needed to get a harness for Ghosty, so I got this um, harness that went pair and tandem. It was like a um, Tedman harness. And I was like, oh, look, I could go pair and tandem because I have the harness for it, and I have two ponies that did, they didn't match at all. Okay, but Mickey Bowen was staying at my farm that winter, and so Mickey Bowen taught me how to drive pair and tandem. And then I entered um, the Laurels. Remember the old show, The Laurels? Mm-hmm. Pennsylvania? Yeah, I entered the Laurels with the pair. It's going to be my first time pair. And Jamie O'Rourke was running the show. Oh, no, no. I entered tandem because I had been practicing tandem. So Jamie O'Rourke called me and he's like, you can't go tandem. I said, why? He goes, it's too dangerous. You're going to have to go pair. And I was like, fine. You know, I was like, Mickey, Jamie won't let me enter the show tandem. She goes, well, does he know you've never driven pair? I'm like, no, he doesn't know I never driven pair, but he won't let me go tandem. So she's like, well, pair's easier. Just go pair. So I went up to the show, and Glenn, I didn't even know how to adjust my reins. I had never driven pair. <laughs> and I was like, well, if he thought tandem was dangerous, think of how dangerous this is that I don't know how to drive pair, and the ponies have never gone pair. <laughs> <laughs> and that was your first pair show? That was my first How'd pair show. I have to ask. It went great. Actually, I won one of the hazards. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you've always been better with less practice. I know. You know? I know. You've always been better that way. But then I didn't really, I wasn't too into, I wasn't too into multiples because it was really hard and you needed a lot of help, Mm -hmm. you know? And I was used to riding. And when you're used to riding and going to shows by yourself, you, you don't, you don't, you know, with pairs, you always need somebody with you. So you need a permanent groom. Um... So anyways, I sold those ponies on, and then I stumbled across Duke and Dante, which, you know, Duke and Dante. Yeah, yeah. And this woman called me, and she she said, I have this horse pair for sale, Arab Welsh. And I was like, I'm not even going to go look at that. Like, why do I want Arab Welsh? I had my fancy Irish drafts. And Sterling actually said, because he was a, a hoarder. So he's like, come on, let's go look. Because he's always wanting to buy, even though he has way too many horses. So we go up there, and I see Duke trot across the field. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to have these ponies. <laughs> so I didn't even drive them or anything. I didn't even ride them or drive them. I just bought them. 
And in fact, the lady that I we don't recommend that, by the way. No. But I mean, everybody does that sometimes. Her name's uh, Myrna Brown, and she actually drives small ponies. She lives in Ocala now. You've probably seen her. Okay. And she put a great start on Duke and Dante. She taught their father to drive in Oregon, and she got paid by the breeder, Julie Mahoney, gave her Duke and Dante. And then she trained Duke and Dante to drive. They drove pair, and they rode, and then I got them. And then I thought... Wow, pear is really hard. But it turns out they're a horrible pair because Duke walks like really fast and Dante walks really slow. So Duke was doing all the pulling and Dante was just letting him do all the work. So that's when I started driving them more tandem. Ah, uh, okay. And, um, and then I did a ton of stuff with them. And then I realized uh, um, that they weren't weaned from each other. Uh, cause they had always been together their entire life. So I started riding them more and I would take one out of the stall and the other one would go insane. And I was like, okay, this is not happening. You're five years old. You have to be weaned. So I started riding them and driving them single more. And then I brought them both through advanced and Dante ended up being a national USEF national champion with Sterling driving. And I was USEF Reserve champion with Duke. Wow. I didn't realize But you know that. why I was reserve champion? Why? I think I sent you these pictures. Here's another lie. I, I think I did get the sportsmanship award for this one, too. Um, I was in cones. I was leading. And I'm never leading because Duke is really bratty in dressage. And, you know, they added the canner part of the dressage test. And it was like disaster, right? So I always started out, like, in the high 60s of combined driving dressage, which is bad. Okay. That's, you want to be the lowest score possible. So I started off like way back and then, um, Duke was so awesome. He like won the marathon. And in fact, the night before marathon, um, Chester was training me at this point. I was taking lessons with Chester and I was super tired. just like the whole live oak experience. And I was coming down with the flu. So I said, I can't do night check. I'm just going to go in and sleep. So I had somebody else do my night check, which was a bad idea. So I get a call from Chester at six in the morning. He's like, get over here right now. Get over here to my barn. Your horse has been running around Live Oak all night. Oh, he got out? Well, somebody left his stall open. Oh, geez. So he, he was out and eating grass, but then there's that like rope around the stables. So he must have gotten outside the rope. And then now he's free. And Live Oak is 5,000 acres, right? And he was running all over Live Oak. Olaf Larson was dumping the manure spreader at like 4 in the morning. And he said it was like the Black Stallion. You know where the Normandy barn is, the racetrack barn? Yes, yep. He said he just heard these thundering hooves in the middle of the night and screaming like the black stallion was free. And he's like, he went to the, the, the racetrack barn and he said, one of the babies is out. And they couldn't find, all the babies were there. So then a couple hours go by and Duke ends up at Chester's personal barn. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm ready for breakfast. And when I got over there, he was in this stall, like in this beautiful barn like bedded up to his knees in straw. And he had these beautiful Swedish girls that had groomed him because he was sweaty. And I went to get him and he's like, I'm not leaving here. He didn't want to go back to the tent stables. <laughs> he wanted a so, nice barn. I know. So I had to pony him back to the tent stables, which is like, like a mile away. And Chester's like, how are you going to do marathon? He's been running around all night. I'm like, <laughs> Look, he never gets tired. He's probably going to be my best marathon ever. And he actually was awesome. I actually, like, I think I won the marathon. I can't remember. But I, I ended up doing so well on marathon that I was going into Cones winning. And I never go into Cones winning. I always go into Cones, like, without a prayer. And then hopefully I go clean and come in somewhere second or third. So I'm going into Cones winning. And I was kind of freaking out because I was like, shh. You know, like I am never going in first. So I was really worried. But the only person close to me was like Sterling by a ball with Dante, which I was happy if 
Dante one, but also, you know, Sterling, he never goes clean and cone. So I wasn't worried at all. Right. I was <laughs> like, okay. And everybody else is like six balls behind me. So I was like, I got this. So I go in and it was the, it was 2008. So all the foreign hands had started coming out to practice for WEG, but we weren't all that, like they weren't all that great at steering their first time out. So Cindy um, O'Reilly, Bob Cook's daughter, was driving the four mares. Remember her, Cindy, Cindy yes. Joe. Yep. So Cindy like misjudged the bridge and just kind of like split the her leaders with the bridge and like drove the carriage up. This mm. is the bridge in cones. So the carriage went up on two wheels. So it like totally took down the bridge. So it was like all a wreck. But they put it back together. But it was still a little bit I, something it must have been a little bit wobbly because by the time it was time for me to go in cones and like remember this cones is like my best face with duke so but he had studs on you know for his shoes so he wouldn't slip in the grass i i go over the bridge it was like cone eight or nine or no it wasn't it was like the end i was at the end so i go over the bridge and his stud gets stuck in the between the boards and he totally wipes out, like down on his front. And I was in a two-wheel carriage. Ugh. So I was getting launched out on the pictures. I'll have to show you these pictures. I'm getting launched out of this carriage. And Duke, I don't know how he does it, just stands up, throws me back in the carriage, and he's fine. So me, you know, this is typical for me. I'm like, wow, that was super dangerous. And I was crying, and I was ready to quit you know I'm like I better go in my poor pony I'm sure he's hurt blah 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 so I start walking back to the in gate and all of a sudden I hear Chester yelling get up go right now get up and go do not come back to this in gate and I was like wow I was scared I was like how am I gonna get out because Jess is gonna kill me if I leave <laughs> So I was like, okay. So I took a deep breath. I'm like, okay, I got to finish. So I was like, I don't even know where I am now. I was like hoping I was at cone 10. Who knows? I just, so I just started. And I was like getting my groove back. I was like, okay, 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 okay. Okay, I'm doing it. But I have no idea now, right? How long I've been down or like feeling sorry for myself or whatnot. So I've totally lost track of time. And I'm like, crap, I only have... One ball between me and Sterling, he, and he's gone clean now for the first time ever in his life, of course. <laughs> and I have no idea how many time penalties I got. So I'm like, I don't mind losing to Dante, but I don't want to lose on time. That's just lame. So I only had three balls left, three cones left. And I was like, I just have to gallop in because I don't know what time I'm at. So I galloped in the last three cones and I hit cone 20. Oh, no. The last and one? The last one, and it came down. And that's how you got second? That's how I got second, by like a tenth of a point or yeah, something. Yeah, but you got beat by your own horse. So that's I know. It wasn't bad. so bad, but I was just like, and I had way too much time. I had tons of time. I didn't have to gallop at all. I could have walked in. <laughs> <laughs> but I you are know. that girl. <laughs> I know. I am that girl. All right, so we're running out of time, but let's fa let's really fast forward. And how far did you get with the fours? You were shortlisted for the wagon in 2010? No, I wasn't. I actually qualified for the four in hand, but, um, you know, doing the four in hand was uh, like a huge challenge, and I'm glad I did it. But my dad was really sick at, at the end that last year, so that was another thing. I just, he passed away like two weeks before I would have shown at WEG. So that just was not a possibility for me, but, um, but I was, I had fun doing the four. I learned a ton. I really thank the USEF for the developing drivers program. It was really awesome. I could have never done it without the USEF. And, um, you know, I, I did the four in hand for some different reasons than other people, which the German coach didn't really understand because I did it because I wanted to take Duke and Dante to do that because I had done them singles pairs I had done them intermediate tandems and then I wanted to do when I heard about WEG I thought well I I think I could do four in hand and everybody told me no you can't you can't do four in hand <laughs> 
So of course I did that. And of course, thanks to Chester for teaching me so much about forehand being like so supportive, you know, like just not just with his knowledge, but his, his, you know, he's, he was my biggest cheerleader when I was doing that and told me I could do it. Hmm. So, and, um, I, the reason that I had a trouble qualifying too, is that at the time you had to have all your horses qualified in all phases. And my dressage was so bad because Duke did a lot of cantering in the team. I also had this one time at Live Oak where I was doing dressage with the team and I halted at X and it's that beautiful grass arena. And so Duke liked to back up a couple steps and then graze. And he did that while I was FEI four in hand at Live Oak. He grazed at X when I was in my <laughs> dressage. That's and I think, good. and and Dr. Vetter was at at C and was laughing. I could hear him laughing <laughs> from the booth. <laughs> and and then I thought back to it. I was like, you know what? I think Duke has grazed at every live oak at X. <laughs> I think that's just his thing. <laughs> the grass is good but there. It was, it's really nice. It was really nice, and he thought that was really funny. But he was. I mean, they were superstars. They. It, having leaders like that allowed me to really learn how to do that. And I, I mean, I had some great moments with the team. Dressage has never been my strong suit in any configuration, uh, but the marathon, they were so good. And I mean, Randy and Keedy helped me so much. You know, they, uh, besides Randy, Keedy and Chester loaning me some great horses, they also you know, trained me. And Randy was my navigator for many of the marathons, which made a big difference. Cause you know, when you're driving team, you're kind of slow about taking your loops and you have to get your timing. And Randy has navigated for so many foreign hands. She navigated for her sister and, you know, she herself drives foreign hands. So it was really, it was really fun. There's nothing like it. That's why I can't show anymore. I know. That's the reason that, you know, people have asked why you don't show anymore. I said, you know, driving a single is boring after you drove four through an obstacle. It is. Yeah. I mean, I maybe would go back to tandem because tandem was really fun. But uh, but Duke and Dante are older now, you know, and I I really enjoyed showing with, with them. It was really fun. Like, I always say um, that... I love Duke and Dante and all the other horses I've had have been there. My pretty pony accessories, <laughs> you know, cause I was like, Oh, well, I can go to Borneo with these ponies. And you know, they've been, they've been really great. I'm so lucky to have had horses like that. And I'm sure I'll have other horses in my life, but those are definitely like, well, those are your lifetime horses. Just like, you know, we, we all have our lifetime horses. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the rest of them, you love the rest of them, but they're not your lifetime horses, which, you, and you yeah. you get that lifetime horse, I believe, that you get the lifetime horse at the point in time in your life when you need the lifetime horse. Yeah, and I had the time then. I had yeah. the time then to focus on driving, and I, that's what I really wanted to do. I remember saying to myself, I was my 30th birthday, and um, Johnny and Diane Smith had this big birthday party for me. It was really nice. Oh, because you like this part of the story. I, um, it was the millennium, right? It was 2000. So my longtime boyfriend asked me to marry him. And I, you know me, I've never wanted to be married. Ever. But I, ever. <laughs> and he knew this, but he just kept trying. So I finally said, yes, fine. Uh, on the millennium. I must have had too much champagne. But I don't know what happened in between that. You know, my birthday is January 9th. By January 9th, I like had sold my house in North Carolina. I was moving to Virginia and I was like not getting married. So in nine, that was the You were engaged days. for nine days? I was engaged for nine days. <laughs> and that's the closest she's ever gotten to a permanent relationship. <laughs> yeah. I was engaged for nine days. That's and funny. so I remember at that 30th birthday party, I said, you know what? I said, I think I had just watched like some videos of four in hand driving. And I said, when I'm 40, I want to have driven four in hand in competition just once. And so I did it. Well, good for you. Well, those <laughs> were some fun stories and I hope everybody enjoyed uh, Wendy's that girl adventures. <laughs> it does seem that I attract hosts that are that girl. Well, if you can't laugh at yourself, you cannot be a <laughs> podcast host. 
<laughs> you know, we've all had our experiences in life. I certainly have had a few. So, you know, but it does seem like that, you know, between Jamie and Helena and Jennifer and, you know, we've all, it's, you've, you've been all that girl. You really have. It's I funny. I know. Well, you know, I don't want to make people feel bad about themselves. That's you it. Know, I want them to all get, <laughs> I want everybody else to feel else better to feel about ribbons. themselves. Yeah. I want everybody else to have the ribbons. I'm not a ribbon hog. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Wendy, for sharing and for opening up today and giving everybody a little insight to your life and how you went from a little tiny tot to driving four in hands at, <laughs> at Live Oak without killing yourself uh, yeah. or the horses. So <laughs> Thanks, thank, thank you, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. You can find Wendy at drwendying.com. You can find uh, us on Facebook. Just search for the dr- the Driving Radio Show. And also, drivingradioshow.com is where you can find all the past episodes that we have done over the last five years. And that is it for today. We'll be back again next week. Thank you, everybody. Off to road to the horse for me. See you, Wendy. All right. Keep the shiny side up.